Be seated, except for Brother Matt. <laughs> Brother Matt, appreciate you take care of this tonight, and then when you are through, you just close it. Thank you, Brother. <clears throat> All right, good evening. Good evening. <laughs> um, tonight, we'll start off reading 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3 and 4. First Corinthians 15, verse 3 and 4 says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried and He rose, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Amen. Uh, so, I was planning on preaching a different message um, on Saturday, and as I was cutting the grass, I just could not... I just, God said I should preach something else, so. <laughs> um, I love the feeling. This one is uh, what I think you had me to talk about, and I think it stepped on my toes a lot, so hopefully it'll step on your toes also. Uh, but it's, um, I kind of titled it, What is the Gospel to You? And I think it's something that, no matter how um, faithful we are at serving, as far as you know, preaching the Gospel and what we believe about the Gospel, there's all definitely more we should and could all be doing. Um, so first of all, I just want to talk about what is the gospel, and I think you know, most of us may know, but it's important to, you know, that's the foundation of all Christianity, of our faith, so as we just read, it's the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, and that he, he died, was buried, and he rose again the third day, and all according to the scriptures. Um, so what does that all mean, the death? Why did Jesus die? Uh, we know that from the law, he didn't deserve to die. He didn't commit anything worthy of death. If we look at uh, 1 Peter 2, verse 22, it kind of speaks to that. 1 Peter 2, 22 says, But it has happened unto them according... Whoops, that's not it. 2 Peter. Huh. Okay, 1 Peter 2, verse 22. So it says, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. So, very clearly, Jesus did no sin, and we know that according to the law, you're punished according to sin. And Jesus was free from that, so, again, he did die according to the scriptures. Why did he die? Um, he didn't deserve to, and we know that we do deserve to die. And Romans 3.23 uh, makes that pretty clear. Look there. It says, for all of sin have come short of the glory of God. So Jesus did nothing worthy of death. We all deserve to die for our sins. So why did Jesus die? And it's very simple, but it's because he loves us and he was willing to die and suffer our eternal punishment so that we could live. And then the burial of Jesus. Why was Jesus buried? Um, and I think this is just something, honestly, I hadn't really thought about specifically why was he buried, you know, why does it specifically talk about the death, burial, and resurrection, not just death and resurrection. Um, and I think at least part of it is showing God's unchangeable, the unchangeableness of his word and the fulfilling of prophecy. Um, if you look at Matthew 12, 40, it says, For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So... Mm -hmm. All the way back in the book of Jonah, it was, you know, and what he went through was a prophecy of what Jesus would go through. If Jesus had just died and then rose back to life right away, the Bible wouldn't be true, you know, God's prophecy wouldn't have been true. So there's God prophesied that for a reason and he fulfilled it just as he said he would. And um, Isaiah 55 11 says, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth, it shall not return unto me void, that shall accomplish that which I please. And it shall prosper in the thing where whereto I sent it. Amen. So again, Jesus says something, you know, God says something. He says it for a reason and he fulfills it to the letter. So I think that's when we think the death, burial, and resurrection, the burial right there is just a reminder of God's unchanging word and his prophecy, just even in the gospel, you know, it even brings that 
aspect in the Old Testament has a lot of prophecy, so I think that's kind of the part there. And then the resurrection, conquering sin and death, you know, um, Romans 1, 4 says, And declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection, resurre resurrection from the dead. So what does the resurrection show? It shows, it declares that Jesus is the Son of God with power. Not just that, you know, there was other people who were raised from the dead. Lazarus was raised from the dead by Jesus. But Jesus, by the power of God being raised from the dead, by the Holy Spirit, shows that he is the Son of God with power. You know, not just someone else's power, but it's his own power. And then Romans 4.10 says, for if, for if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, so we were reconciled, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So Jesus' death reconciles us to God. You know, that takes the punishment, but his resurrection gives us life. You know, we deserve death. He takes away the death through his death, and then through his life we get life. So it's a two kind of a two-step thing there, and both of which are very important for us. And um, obviously we don't deserve that, but it's, you know I think it's just important for us to understand what is the gospel. What are those the death, burial, and resurrection? We hear that, but you know. It's important to think about what does that mean. Um, so, again, the title of the message, what is the gospel to you? So, first of all, what is the gospel? Second of all, what is the gospel to you specifically? There's just some questions that I thought of, and a lot of these are very uh, self-convicting. So, but just some questions to help us consider what the gospel is to us and help us determine really what, what do we feel about the gospel, what do we believe about the gospel, not just being a Christian or not being a Christian, what do we personally believe about the gospel? So the first question of that is, do you really believe the gospel? Do you really believe the literal uh, interpretation of the gospel? You know, the gospel says that Jesus was resurrected. Do you really believe the resurrection is literally real, that we will literally all be resurrected from the dead? We will all, you know, unless the rapture happens first, we will all die, and then we will all come back to life. You know, Jesus will literally raise our bodies from the dead. And, you know, and I think, you know, I don't claim to know everyone's salvation, you know, salvation situation, but um, I think it's all what God tells us to search, you know, to consider our own salvation and always consider that. Um, there are a lot of people who don't even believe in the resurrection, much less in the gospel, but those that do claim to be Christians, some kind of... Uh, take the resurrection as kind of a metaphor or don't take it literally. So if maybe you don't believe in life after death. Maybe you think um, just going to church and being a Christian is a good way to live. Uh, there are a lot of people who do think that. Maybe you think that uh, Christianity is a nice religion, that it's a good way of life, that you know, you raise good families, raise good kids that way. But, uh, but the idea of life after death or the, uh, the idea of heaven and hell is a little strange. You know, maybe you just kind of on the fence about that. But um, if anyone is on the fence, 1 Corinthians 15, 12, started reading there. Um, but I was just reading this the other day. It's pretty clear. And uh, I think Paul was clarifying the truth of the resurrection to some people or to some non-believers. 1 Corinthians Chapter 15, starting verse 12, we'll read through 19. It says, Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he hath raised that he raised up Jesus, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead raise, rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is Christ not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Mm. So, I mean, I think that's, pretty clear, especially the last verse there, but then if you skip down to verse 32, that same chapter, 15, um, 
verse 32, says, If after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage, this is Paul talking, Ephesus, what advantage, what advantage it, it me if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. You know, and I think this is the attitude of a lot of our society, even a lot of what, uh, a lot of people who might claim to be Christians, you know, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die, let us, you know, live for this life, that's the, yeah. Um, I forget what the saying is, but there's a there's a uh, acronym people use. But if if this is the only life, then why would you not live for this life? Why would you not just live to be whatever you know makes you happy in whatever sinful, sick way that might be? And that's a lot of people's attitude. So if you don't believe in the literal literal resurrection from the dead, what's there to gain by being a Christian, really? Why on earth would you be a Christian? You know, verse 19 again, it says, If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. So there is nothing about being a Christian that you should think is going to gratify the flesh or gratify you in this life inherently. It says, if Christ, you know, if, if Christianity is just a fairy tale, then there is, we are of all men most miserable. That's a very serious Sorry. statement. And we know, I know that that is not the case, but you know, if you really have to think about what is your own um, stance towards the gospel, what do you believe about Christ. If it's just uh, make-believe or if it's just you kind of half-believe, you half-don't, there's really no benefit to that. And Christ is, doesn't mix words about that either. You know, We're never told that if you're a Christian, your life's going to be easy, you'll be rich, and you'll have everything you want. Um, so what does God say about life after death, though? Um, in that same chapter, if you look at especially verse uh, 20 and 23 of 1 Corinthians 15, it says, well, I'll, I'll start back up, let's see, I'll start back in 17, it says, And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins, then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all men most miserable. But... Amen. Now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Jump down to 23 says, but, it, but every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, after that, afterward, they that are Christ at his coming. So, just emphasizing, but Christ is not dead, Christ is alive, he's risen. Amen. And every man in his order, Christ the first fruits, afterward, they that are Christ at his coming. So we will all be resurrected. So Christ will be. Uh, those that, who are Christ's will be raised at his coming. And then John 5, 28, we'll read over there, 5, 28, 29, says, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice, and shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. So, whether you believe in Christ or you don't believe in Christ, says the hour is, is coming that all they are in the grave shall hear his voice. Everyone will be raised. Those that have got, done good, and we know from other scriptures done good doesn't mean doing uh, good works yourself and getting into heaven, but trusting in Christ's goodness, believing the gospel um, unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. So everyone will be raised. We will be judged according to our works. If we are Christ, we'll be judged according to Christ's goodness, covering us. And if we're judged, if we don't trust Christ, then we're on our own, and we'll be judged according to our works. And a lot of people have the idea that that might be a good thing for them, that there's some kind of scale. But, you know, I've, Ray Cumphrey uses this example a lot. If, you know, if someone is a serial killer, but they've done a lot of community service, is the judge going to let him off because he did a lot of community service? That, no, you're a serial killer. You know, you've committed these crimes, this is the punishment. And God is so much more holy and just than that. There is no person who's going to be able to say, God, I was perfect, or God, my good always my bad. It's either Christ's goodness covering us, or it's the resurrection to damnation. So, if you're here today and you don't, or you're listening to this online, if you don't believe the, truly believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus for your sins, I really I beg you to think about these two things. Hebrews 10.31 says, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But Mark 1.15 says, in saying, 
The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye, and believe the gospel. Right. So, the first question there again, what is the gospel to you? Do you believe the gospel? Do you believe it literally? Do you really believe what it says, or do you believe it kind of figuratively? It's really important to consider that. The second part of the sermon, uh, from the question here is, is the gospel why you live your life, or is it just a part of your life? You know, how does how does the gospel affect your life? If you claim to believe the gospel, how does it affect your life? How should it affect your life, but how does it affect your life? And this is, you know, at least for me personally, very convicting. We know that if Christ suffered our eternal punishment in hell, you know, the equivalent of that, what should we not do for Christ? What are, you know, we think, well, I'll do this, and that'll be good enough to kind of make... God happy, but, you know, there's nothing, you know, for completely perfect servants, God says we are just, you know, meeting the quota. That's right. <laughs> so, but, so, yeah. is the gospel why you live your life, or is it just a part of your life? What do people, what do the people around you see, you know, not just what do you think about, what do you consider your stance to be, but if you asked other people, what would they say about what the gospel means to you? So, you know, if you ask your coworkers or those, you know, people who are around a lot, would they say that you care about the gospel? Would they? What, how much would they say you care about the gospel? What would they say the gospel means to you? What, are you, what would your friends say? What would your relatives say? Those that know you a little better than that than your coworkers do. You know, do they see it in your life in the way you live? And then. Even closer, what would your spouse or your children say about how much you care about the gospel or what the gospel means to you? You know, those are the people who see us every day that know what we really think and what we really believe and don't believe and where we're faking and where we're not, you know, as much as another person can know. At the end of the day, God knows. But, Man. you know, really think about what would, what would other people, what do they think, you know, not knowing what you know, but knowing what they know, what would they think about what the gospel means to you? Um, and then another way to think about it is what occupies most of your time. And I know we're all very busy and there's a lot of pulls on our time. And I, I definitely don't feel like I always use my time the way I should. But um, So what occupies most of your time? Is it, the God, is it things that uh, further the gospel? Does the work of Christ, that the work that he would have you do, does that come first in your life? Or does... Do other things come first? Are you too busy with things of this world? Whether they be, you know, whatever they would be. There's a lot of different pulls on our time. Are those things coming first? Do you feel too busy to do the things that God would have you do? And what, you know, what does God tell us to do? He says, preach the gospel to every creature. So that's God's work. Whether you're man, woman, boy, girl, if you trust in Christ, or to preach the gospel to every creature, you know, talk to other people, tell them about Christ. Um, so if the gospel is... Truly, why you live your life, there should be certain answers to those, but if it's just a part of why you, if it's just a part of your life or a characteristic of you, but it's not your whole life, then you'll have other answers, you know. If, if the furtherance of the gospel is kind of like tenth on your plate, then that's not really why you live your life. So, you know, we can think of Paul, who's a man who was not perfect, but you can tell that man lived his life for the furtherance of the gospel. And um, yeah. just one, one other way to think about, is this why we live our life or is it a part of our life? So what occupies most of your thoughts? You know, there's also doing works is one thing, you know, doing things is one thing, saying things is one thing, but what do you think about? What do you care about the most in your own mind? Um, is it what Christ has done for you that you think about? What, you know, Jesus paid that the eternal punishment in hell for you, do you think about that? And um, do you think about how you can share this with other people? Is that what's on your mind? How can you talk to people, you know, pray about God opening doors? You know, I think we all come short of this, but, you know, we really, that should be our main motive, obviously. And um, another thing, what occupies your thoughts? You know, if we know that Christ died, our eternal uh, Christ suffered our eternal punishment in hell so that we won't have to and that we have eternal life instead. 
we really shouldn't be too worried about things that happen in the 70 years of our life. It is pretty much nothing in comparison. All right. So are you constantly stressed? Are you constantly worried about things? The Gospel shows us that we don't really need to be worried over anything. Philippians 4, 6 says, Be careful for nothing. It's pretty all-encompassing. Amen. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. So, if we're, if we're always stressed, we're worried, or fearful, um, fear does not come from the Lord. Fear comes from our minds and from Satan's temptation. So, stress, worry are variations of fear. Mm -hmm. um, so, another thing to consider is do you really love the gospel? You know, and I, I know personally at least that there's there's a difference between talking about the gospel, you know, claiming to be a Christian, being around other Christians is one thing. But do you really love the gospel? Do you is that what your heart's desire is? Do you think about what Jesus has done for you? Um, or is the talking about the gospel is that a burden to you? Do you you know, if the subject is brought up of uh, the gospel or Jesus or something like that, do you try to um, change the subject, start talking about something else, does that make you feel awkward? Or do you want does that make you happy? Do you want to tell people about that? Do you want to uh, talk about that more, you know? Um, Psalm 96.3, right over there, uh, speaks to how we're supposed to talk and think around other people. Psalm 96.3 says, Declare his glory among the heathen, his wonders among the people, among all people. Amen. So it doesn't say declare his glory among the other Christians who agree with you. Hmm. It says declare his glory among the heathen, which is pretty much the opposite. Hmm. There's heathen all around us. It says his wonders among all people. So if that doesn't cover everybody, the heathen, then all people co covers all people. <laughs> so you know that's that's what we're supposed to do. So. Especially if the subject comes up, we should certainly want to talk about Christ. But you know, if that's always on your mind, always on your heart, and you know, it's something that you'll bring up yourself. And um, God says that if we really love Him, we should keep His commandments. And First John five three pretty much says that only better. It says, "For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous to us, or they're not grievous." So even if we keep God's commandments. If we feel like they're a drag or we hate doing that, then that's not really keeping the commandments. <laughs> you know, just doing the work or just going through the motions is not what God's after. God's after our heart. God's after what do we love. It says, for this is the love of God that we keep His commandments. Amen. If we really love God, we'll keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous. Matthew 28, 19 says, which is one of his commandments, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. So, that is another, you know, that's God's commandment. We love doing that. You know, we all certainly are tempted by the flesh. You know, we don't, there's a lot, <laughs> the things that God would have us do, we ourselves in our flesh don't usually want to do. We make up a reason not to do it, or we have an excuse, or we get focused on things of the world or feel like we're too busy, but we also have the Holy Spirit. If we trust Christ as our Savior, God says that the Holy Spirit dwells within us. We are the temple of the living God. So, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Amen. So, we can overcome that, and it's not our own strength. It's just by not relying on our own strength. It's just asking God, you know, help me to love what you love. You know, help me to focus on what you want me to focus on. Um, so, do you really love the gospel? What is the gospel to you? Do you really love the gospel? And uh, another question for us to ask ourselves as to what do we, what is the gospel to us? Is the gospel really why you live your life? If it is, what we talked about earlier, if it is, you'll have different actions. People will see different things about you. But certainly, the gospel should be the reason we live our lives. You know, we were buried in sin in the likeness of his death and raised in the likeness of his resurrection. You know, when we're baptized, that's a picture of dead to ourselves, alive to Christ. Where we come out, I just think about you know, we come up out of the water there. Um, 
don't know, I've, this is the way I think about it, but you come a pastor, you're like, all right, now I'm Christ and time to be doing his business. <laughs> you know, I'm not mine anymore. I'm here to serve him. That's what we're supposed to do. So, um, and certainly we're not all perfect, or any of us perfect at that. Um, and the gospel should also shape how we live our lives. Again, how do we conduct ourselves around our coworkers, around our friends, around our relatives, around our spouse, around our children. You know, these are people that we have the blessed opportunity to be a witness just in how we act, but certainly also what we talk about. We should tell certainly our immediate family about the gospel. We should tell our relatives, our friends about the gospel. You know, there should be the gospel basically is the answer to all of life's questions, all of life's problems. If you have a problem, but you know Jesus as your Savior, it's all good. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior and you have no problems, you have the biggest problem in the world. Amen. So um, everybody that we come in contact with, we should really think about, like, we would, we would never want to see anyone go to hell. But we know that God is just, and we also know that God is going to do what's right and what is good. But while we're here, while we're alive, we're here to preach the gospel to a lost and dying world. So um, we're willing, you know, we love those around us enough that we would tell them the truth and tell them the only way to be saved. So uh, I just, this is a little unusual perhaps, but there's a Newsboys song. I have the lyrics here. That I think really wraps a good definition of how we should live our lives and what we should be doing. Um, it says, I'm about one name, one life, one story. I'm alive to bring you glory. You took my blame and you paid the debt that I paid the debt I owe. I'm gonna lay me down to lift you up. You're the only king in the kingdom come. If I live, if I die, my life will show you're my hero. That's from the Newsboy song, Hero. Amen. But I think that, especially that first line, I'm about one name, one life, one story. You know, our lives do not need to be complicated. It should be very clear. We have one thing we're supposed to be about. And that will shape everything else in our lives. It will give us guidance in everything else in our lives. But we are only supposed to be about one thing in our life. And that's Jesus Christ. So, just reiterating, kind of wrapping up here. What is the gospel to you? We you say with uh, Peter in 1 Peter 1, 8 through 9, it says, Whom having not seen, ye love, and whom though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. You know, it can't get any better than that. No. Or, or what is the gospel to you, or what do you say with the unbelieving? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. You know, if you don't believe the gospel, if you don't believe the literal death, burial and resurrection of Jesus, if you don't believe that we're all going to live again, then you know, that would be your attitude. But remember what John 3.36 says. It says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. Hath, right now. We have everlasting life to believe on the Son. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. It's on him right now. It will stay on him for eternity, mm -hmm. unless you're saved. But the wonderful news of the gospel is very clear, very simple. You know, it's not given, you know, the wise, the strong of the world. It's just the simplicity of the gospel is all that God tells us to believe. Acts 16.31 says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Amen. And that will wrap it up. I'll Amen. go ahead and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you for all that you've done for us. Lord, we thank you most of all for the wonderful and joyful salvation we have in Jesus Christ alone, Lord. And mm -hmm. We're so thankful for your word, for the guidance you've given us, Lord, that you've not left us without instruction, but you've left, left us with um, only the most true reasons to be joyful in this world. Lord, I pray that you give us guidance and help us to follow you, Lord. We know that uh, our flesh doesn't want to, Lord, and just pray you help us to die to ourselves daily and to live unto you, Lord. Yes. Have our eyes on how blessed we'll be in eternity and that every promise of yours is true. And that we don't need to get too caught up in the things of this world, Lord, but we should be very focused on the one wonderful story of Jesus Christ, Lord. Just pray you give us grace uh, in all that we do, Lord. Pray for being here. 
for those around us, Lord, that don't know you, I pray, Father, for your love, you'd save many souls, Lord. And just pray that you'd help us to be about your business while we're here. And pray for your return, Lord. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.